A few years ago, I heard about an interesting project. Someone was working on a documentary film about miniature wargaming. And not an amateur level production like we're doing here on YouTube. I mean, an actual feature documentary with a professional crew. The project took on Kickstarter backers in 2015 and was finally delivered to those supporters at the end of 2018. The director, Joe Piddington, made the rounds of the award shows and film festivals in 2019. Which brings us to the present, when Miniature Wargaming the Movie is finally available to the masses for rent or purchase at uh, places like Apple TV, Amazon Prime, or Google Play. So I downloaded it over the holidays, and I watched. I'm going to give a review of the movie with some light spoilers, so if you want to watch it with completely fresh eyes, you should click away now. If you don't mind some mild spoilers and a brutally honest take on this film, let's get into it. And at the end of the review, we'll have a surprise guest. Right out of the gate, we open with a very strange scene that sort of sets the tone for a documentary that I think has a bit of an identity crisis. In that opening scene, we see some guys who are dressed up as uh, modern soldiers or special forces troops, and they're doing some kind of infiltration operation through the woods. Now look, reenacting, cosplaying, LARPing, those are all interesting activities in their own right, but they don't have anything to do with miniature wargaming. Thankfully, this awkward opening scene ends after about a minute without any further explanation, and we never return to that reenactment again. Why it was the opening scene of the movie still remains a bit of a mystery to me. Over the course of the next 30 minutes, we're introduced to four individual wargamers, and the rest of the documentary uses their personal stories as a prism to explore the hobby. We have Andy, a veteran who uses gaming to cope with PTSD, Chris, a former Games Workshop employee who's now trying to start his own gaming company, and we have Adam and Matthew, two friends who want to play in a big international uh, World War II bolt action tournament. The idea of weaving disparate personal stories into a larger thematic narrative is a solid, time-tested, documentary-style approach. And I think it's a great way, in this case, to explore a hobby as broad as miniature wargaming. In the first half of what is essentially a two-hour film, we also get a nice history of the hobby from Henry Hyde, along with some fantastic graphics and timeline imagery. This is all really well done. I'm Henry Hyde. I live in beautiful Brighton & Hove on the Sussex coast. What I do is I'm a designer, a writer, and an editor. As you can see from that short clip, this is a beautifully shot documentary. It was much more professional and much more polished than I expected, which was a very welcome surprise. But there are some unwelcome surprises as well. Henry Hyde completely disappears from the second half of the film, which is a little bit odd, as I assumed that this was a documentary that was intended to introduce a new audience to a hobby, historical miniature wargaming, that they probably know nothing about. But the second half of the documentary focuses completely on the four individual stories that I mentioned earlier, and that's where some serious cracks are exposed. There are two big issues at play in the second half of the film. First, none of the four personal stories are woven together in the way that you would expect. None of these characters meet physically or thematically, which kind of left me wondering why their stories were chosen in particular. Second, and perhaps more disappointing, all of the stories are just kind of sad. I expected this film to be a celebration of miniature wargaming and what makes it great, but in each of the four stories we follow, no one gets what they want. This is the part where I don't really want to spoil specifics for you in case you do decide to watch, but each of the four stories end in disappointment, stress, or some kind of financial hardship for the characters. Even the original music throughout the film is slow and somber, which just kind of sets a downbeat tone. Transitions between the stories are generally made with slow-mo tracking shots, which are beautiful, but a constant reminder that cool drone footage is not a replacement for storytelling. And that is what's really frustrating about watching Miniature Wargaming the movie. Hints of compelling storylines are teased, but never fully explored. And I think Rick Priestley is a great example of that. Yeah, my career at Games Workshop's been really interesting because I started off putting toy soldiers in boxes, very quickly became um, 
the guy at the studio who was in control of the development of the product range for uh, the written material, not the toy soldiers, just the written stuff. And then when the company expanded and we got lots more games designers, I became, in effect, our chief designer for tabletop war games. Rick Priestley appears in an all too quick cameo in this movie, and I felt like his two minutes on screen were among the best. As a, a lifelong hobbyist, I know enough about his story to tell you that it could have been the centerpiece of a really interesting documentary in its own right. He was the lead rule developer for some of the most popular war games ever written by Games Workshop, and he's continued to have a fascinating career at Warlord Games. The middle portion of the film touches on the business side of the hobby. So in addition to hearing from Rick Priestley, you also get to hear from the Perry Twins, uh, John Stollard of Warlord Games, we get to see Mantic Games and Battlefront. This section of the documentary I found to be very interesting. And this cuts to the heart of the identity crisis happening in this documentary. Who is it made for? If it's a movie made to connect to a new audience, it's not informative or encouraging enough. Whereas if it's a documentary made to appeal to tabletop veterans like me, then the focus should have been much more on characters like Rick Priestley, the Perry Twins, or Dave and Matthew from Mini Wargaming. The net result after almost two hours is a little bit head-scratching. Every documentary tries to deliver some kind of theme or message, and the subject matter they're exploring is, is just the vehicle being used to convey that message. I'm gonna go back 15 years here, but you know, one of my favorite documentaries of all time is The Smartest Guys in the Room. Yes, that documentary explores the rise and fall of Enron, but at the end, the director is conveying a bigger story about how personal greed and a lack of corporate oversight can dovetail into a toxic cocktail. That is a message, and Enron is, is just the vehicle being used to convey that message. I don't really know what the message of Miniature Wargaming the movie is. And that's frustrating because there were several promising themes that could have been picked up. As it stands, the only overarching message that I could gather is that Miniature Wargaming provides some kind of vague, positive outlet in the lives of these four people. But if that's what we're supposed to take away, couldn't we have shown them having, I don't know, a bit more fun? And as a lifelong fan of the hobby, I hope that someday someone turns their attention to that with the same level of professionalism and production values that we got in this film. Until then, Miniature Wargaming the Movie is the only feature-length documentary about our hobby. It's beautifully shot, and in the middle third, I will admit that I was very engaged. At just $3.99, it's not really a big commitment, and it's looking like a long, cold winter ahead while we wait for COVID vaccines to roll out. So if you want to give it a shot, it is available for rent or purchase right now on places like uh, Apple Plus, Amazon Prime, Google Play, and other platforms. Okay, you made it all the way to the end of the review, where I promised we would be joined by a surprise guest. Hi, my name is Joseph Pinnington, and I'm the director of Miniature Wargaming the Movie, and I'm based in Devon in England. Uh, so glad you're able to uh, hop on a call here, Joe. It's a real treat to be able to review a movie and then immediately get the opportunity to talk to the director and producer of that movie. And uh, I want to jump uh, straight into probably my, my number one question that I had after watching, which was, uh, could you let us know how, how did you meet the four people that were the focus of the movie and what was it about their stories that you found compelling? For everyone that's in the film, there was a main purpose. And when it came to the four, or well, it's really three stories, but it's four people that we followed. And it was actually over the course of two years. So to start off with Chris Nichols, when I was um, looking, and actually when we, we crowdfunded the film, um, he sent me an email and he literally was just like, I oh, told me who he was, that he's kind of just left Mantic and Tor Gaming and he'd set up his own company. I jumped on a Skype call just like this and um, he basically just told me his story and I was just kind of, as soon as I spoke to him I just knew that there was something um, about, because it was, uh, his stories are very similar to so many other people that work in the industry. So I really wanted to highlight the core of what the industry is, forget the big companies you know like Wall Wall of Games or Games Workshop because they've got you know you could do a whole documentary just on them so that's how I met Chris and it, 
like I said, I just went up and it was, if he never sent me the email, I probably, you know, he might not have been in the film. But I was looking for subjects. Um, and whilst I was looking, you know, I went through, there was lots of people I spoke to and I met. And actually, I went to an event um, that was a bolt action event with Matt and Adam. And I'll come to them in a minute because we had l l kind of, I've known them for almost 15, 20 years. Um, but when I was at an event with Matt and Adam, I got introduced to Andy Bryant. And I, s I sat down, we went for dinner, and he kind of, t again, just told me his story. And I knew one of the core things I wanted to highlight in, in the film is how this industry can help with mental health. So yeah, that was kind of how I met the main people in the film. So one of the things that I was hoping for as a viewer was that the stories of whoever you chose, and I understand the reasons for each of them individually, were going to tie together somehow. I, I was thinking originally, oh, well, maybe all these people are gonna meet at Salute. You know, that's the biggest show in the UK, maybe the biggest in the world. Um, and the stories never came together, and I, and what I was wondering after I saw it was, did you have other stories that you considered telling, but you had to leave them on the cutting room floor? Or was it a question of resources where you, you wanted to pick up a couple more, but you had to focus on these four for financial reasons? So yeah, that's a good question. It's something that's come up because the stories throughout the film, when you watch it, um, they don't um, connect together, they are interlaced. And that was actually done deliberately um, because they were all going to significantly different events. It was to try to show the scope of the industry and what there is. So I didn't want to kind of convolute each person's, you know, there, there could have been, the fact is they don't know each other in real life. The only person that actually ha they, that, that have met is Andy and Matt, and that was a, a, a different event. I thought if they all came together at the end or they all met, I, th I think it would have been um, it would have been a lie and I didn't want to kind of put that together because they don't know each other and that was the whole purpose of the film and you know and I'm sure we'll come on to this there's aspects of the film that you know some people just might not like because it, ha it goes in a certain direction that was the whole thing I just followed the story and I didn't want it to be at you know, I didn't want to fake things. I didn't want it to be, because these are real people's lives. And you know, the fact of the matter is, what these people go through is the re reality of the industry. And some people might not like that because you know, they either don't work in the industry or they've got a certain perception because of it's their hobby. But for most people, and it's very interesting because a lot of people that work in the industry, um, they come back and go, you have no idea how relatable this film is because, you know, pretty much everyone I know goes through these things. So yeah, that was kind of the reason why it goes in that direction. So yeah. <laughs> I've heard you give uh, other interviews before when you were making the film Festival Circuit. I've watched some of those online and I know this was your first uh, feature length film project. So I'm sure you learned a lot of lessons along the way over the course of the journey. And uh, if you could, if you could narrow that down to maybe like the two most important takeaways that you got from this experience that might help you on your next project, uh, what would those one or two things be? Yeah, so it's, that's an amazing question because two is going to be hard because there's so many takeaways. It's like anything, you know, until you do it. And I've worked with it on this film, especially I've worked with professionals that have worked in the industry for many, many years to people that were still, you know, in film school and to people that are self-taught, you know, so there's a lot of takeaways. The, what, the main one that I've learned is you need to give yourself time to breathe. And it's one of the things that I look back and it's a hindsight thing. You look back on the, the finished film and, you know, I spent, three solid years full time into this film to get it made if you know it's like anything if you spend all that time if you're painting a miniature for 30 hours straight or whatever it is and then you go back and look at it a week's time you're like oh okay well maybe I could have done that differently so that's the main thing I would give myself a bit more time to just breathe and just be away from the project to then have a look at it because you kind of come with it fresh eyes and the other thing is get work with people that you look up to you respect and 
it's like raising kids, you know, it takes a village to raise children. It's kind of the same thing when it comes to making a film. It takes a village. Like, I couldn't do everything myself. And if I did, it would take me probably another 10 years to learn all the skills needed. So, yeah, they're, they're the two things. So I want to get you out of here on this question. Now that you've gotten to the end of this journey, maybe this is the last thing you want to think about right now. Maybe not. Uh, what is it that's coming next for you? Uh, you know, you're, you're now a feature length filmmaker, so I'm sure you've got some other project rattling around in your mind. And what's the state of that project, whatever it is? So, yeah, there's... So the first thing, there is something already planned um, for keen-eyed people that have watched to the very end of the film, there is a post credit scene um, after the credits that basically is a clip of Rick who, and it cuts and it's very dramatic and um, it winds lots of people up because they want to know what, what it is he's talking about when it comes to um, Carl Franz and the Warhammer fantasy and the story that he wrote that never got released. So the idea is we're going to release a web series called The Wargaming Stories that will, I'm hoping, satisfy everyone's need that, you know, maybe wanted the film to be more um, kind of ho for hobbyists. So the idea is to release and to edit the full length interview of almost everyone we interviewed in the film. And again, there's going to be certain people that won't want to be in it. So, you know, we're going to have to get new contracts. But, the you know, Rick has been the first per person to sign up to it. And just to, you know, an example, his interview was four, I think, it, no, six hours long, edited down to four. And in this cut, it will probably be three hours. The goal is to go in, once we've edited the interviews, to go and shoot more B-roll to go over the top of it and to go with what they're talking about. So um, that is in the works. It's going to be called Wargaming Stories. It will be a paid web series um, and we're going to probably crowdfund it. Um, you know, we're not talking loads of money. It, we're probably talking, you'll probably pay for the episodes you want or there'll be a package that has all the interviews. But I think we've got something like 28 interviews from different people. I, there's some really amazing stories that I know people will want to hear. So yeah, so that's what I'm going to do next. Well, that's really funny to hear you say that because uh, the, one of the comments that I had in my review of the film is that I, I wish that there was a documentary about Rick Priestley because I, I find him to be a particularly fascinating industry insider with his story. So if that's going to be a, a web series episode, I'm, I'm paying a couple dollars for that one. That's that's for sure. That's that's what I'm looking forward to. Um, I, I've monopolized over half an hour of your time and I, I really appreciate you hopping on a transatlantic call to talk about the film, answer some questions about it. Um, thank you so much, Joe, and I wish you the best of luck as you move on to the web series. I, as a hobbyist, am very excited to see something like that. Perfect. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And again, you know, I'm going to plug the film, obviously, if you haven't seen it. It's on Amazon Prime, it's on Apple TV, it's on Google Play, Vudu and Vimeo On Demand in North America, with a UK release coming this year, 2021. That was cool, getting to talk to the director himself about the film. And he and I spoke for a lot longer than you saw in this video about topics like the pros and cons of using Kickstarter, why there aren't any Americans in the film, and of course, what was going on with that opening scene. As it turns out, there's a story behind that opening sequence. So if you want to hear about that and much more, you can watch the complete unedited 30-minute version of the interview on the free stuff page of LittleWarsTV.com.